you, thank you so much for being here on a Friday afternoon. I'm super excited that we get to hang out. For those of you that don't know me, mi nombre es el Dr. Jose Luis Medina Hernández Franco López Jr. Díaz Cruz. And I want to welcome you to our This Madre in the Name of Equidad and Social Justice live webinar focused on the intersection of Identidad and Language, Latinx, Latine, Wetback, Pocho, y más, with one of my favorite people, I, I really want to um, thank El Dr. Rodriguez for being here. Um, El Dr. Jesus Rodriguez is the executive director at the Buentos, Bueno Center, and um, he's going to introduce himself a little bit more in just a moment. Doctor, gracias por estar con nosotros. Se lo agradezco. Gracias, gracias. Happy to be here. Thank you. This is really about creating this madre, good trouble in el nombre de equidad and social justice. So we will be um, reading your chat comments so that if you have any questions for el doctor, nos dejan saber. Um, you will notice that both uh, Dr. Rodriguez and I have been using todes um, just to be more inclusive, verdad? Uh, my pronouns are él, he, his, him, and I'm sure that el doctor will share in just a moment. So, Doctor, gracias por estar con nosotros. I'm super, super thrilled that you said yes. I was kind of shocked. I, I When I first asked you, I thought like I was asking somebody like, you know, out in high school, I was like, ojale que diga que sí, ojale que diga que sí. So I'm super, super thrilled that you said yes. Um, Doctor Rodriguez, we're going to go ahead and get started. I am recording so that folks that aren't able to be with us can later see this. Um, and I shared with you just a couple of framework questions, but we're going to start with a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Por qué está aquí? Qué onda? Qué we'll start there. Perfecto. Let me just say, uh, um, when you asked me, um, I, I also felt sort of that high school, uh, um, uh, um, so before he asked me, everyone, I thought he was friend putting me in the friend zone uh, because, because he had said, hey, we need to collaborate someday. I said, yeah, sounds good. And and uh, and then when he asked me, I thought, oh, he didn't put me in the friend zone. Um, and so aquí estamos. Um, my, my name is Jesus Rodriguez and uh, I share with folks que si me llegaron a conocer antes de que me graduara de la universidad, también eh, mis amigos y mi familia me conocen como Jesse. Uh, mis, mis pronombres son um, él, he, him, his. Um, I identify in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I, I um, identify as Chicano. I as, identify as uh, Mexican. I identify um, as Latino of uh, Mexican indigenous descent. Um, and and uh, really excited uh, to talk with all of you today um, about those, uh, uh, again, the, the intersection of all of those identities and, and what some of those mean for me. Um, también, este, como ya se, ya se dieron cuenta, que, que este, hablo Spanglish y también un poquito de inglés y un poquito de español. Um, and I also identify as uh, Cosme's dad, as, as Eleanor's esposo, como el hijo de Gerardo y de Alma Rosa, este, eh, hermano de Diana y de Nelson. Um, and um, I'm a higher ed professional now, and I, I joke with folks when I have the opportunity to share that, um, that I'm unconventional uh, because I... I um, thought I would be a kindergarten teacher for 30 years. Um, and before joining the Bueno Center at CU Boulder, um, I, I was a teacher and I was a, a, a principal um, and a, a instructional superintendent um, in a PK-12 system. And siempre, desde niño, bien desmadroso, uh, not always causing good trouble. Uh, um, that's uh, that's an evolution for me. Um, and and I'll, I'll share some stories about that um, here in a little bit. But um, yeah, there's a little bit little bit about myself. Thank you, Doctor. So actually, that's my my second question, right? Um, I shared with you that I wanted to start this YouTube kind of live webinar series called Des Madre, um, because in November of 2018, I was presenting at La Cosecha and I remember creating the, the PowerPoint and I had a slide that said, 
something along the lines of dual language is about creating this madre in the name of equidad and social justice. And I showed it to my husband, Tony, and he said, uh, Medina, you know, he calls me Medina because he's former military. And he said, you can't do that. You're like a language um, researcher. You can't be saying this madre at the La Cosecha. And I said, but it needs to be said. And so I said it. And I remember being in a big, huge ballroom with tons of people. And when I said this madre, there was a gasp. Um, but that was three years ago. And now people seem to embrace it. Like one time I was uh, at an airport actually coming from La Cosecha and somebody said, Dr. Medina, this madre. And I was like, okay, people are, are aligning with it. So here's your question. What does this madre mean to you and how does it impact the work that you do? Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and I'll just say, I think it, it does in a significant way. And, and that's why I said, siempre ha sido bien desmadroso. Um, um, I wanna tell you a couple of stories. So one is that um, when I was a kid in, in elementary school and middle school and high school, um, I got in a lot of trouble, but it usually was not good trouble. It was the bad kind of trouble. And uh, I, I was suspended from school a lot of times. Um, they had to call my mom to come and pick me up from school. and every single time that she picked me up i don't know if she's on here um i think she was planning to maybe join but uh um she knows this story that uh, every single time we were on in the car and driving home me decía uh que, que todavía ella tenía la esperanza que un día le iban a llamar de mi escuela para decirle de algo bueno que hice and uh that stuck with me because she never got that phone call, unfortunately, from, from my school. And so um, I think about my own experiences as a student um, that weren't great ones. That, like I barely graduated from high school. I was super truant. Um, I, I didn't have the resources uh, or support um, to uh, um, even to see myself one day uh, graduating high school on time and then uh, uh, matriculating into a four-year university. When I finally graduated, and it, I don't know how much time we have, um, I know exactly how much time we have, I'm sorry, but we may, I may have uh, uh, the opportunity to share this story with you too, of how I ended up finally going to college, but uh, um, the, the experiences that I had as a student, um, just weren't really great ones. And, and when I decided I wanted to be an educator, it was specifically with the intent of dismantling, uh, uh, disrupting, um, uh, uh, um, <laughs> um, systems and, and practices that uh, were oppressive for, for kids like me. And I remember when I, when I became a principal and I, again, uh, I think maybe some of our, my colleagues from, from those days are here, but I, I used to share this story with my community, with students, y con padres de familia, y, uh, with teachers and, and my supervisors. That story I just shared with you about uh, my mom never got that call of the good things I was doing in school. Um, and, and of course, we made it a point as a community to make these positive phone calls and connections and build relationships with students and their families um, as something that uh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of having done. And also just one example of one of those ways of, of, of trying to disrupt um, those, you know, oppressive systems that that students experience in schools and um, yeah, uh, um, <laughs> but it, my mom knows super mischievous and like I said, this madroso. Uh, um, uh, you know, I I I think she she would agree that that um, my my this madre has evolved into uh, um, good trouble. Finally, <laughs> well, I love I love all of it. Right, first of all, it makes you even more intriguing because you and I have traveled in the same circles and we've seen each other speak. But it's the first time that we're getting to get to know each other a little bit more deeply. So the fact that you um, had these obstacles in school says a lot about the person that you are and the educational servant that you are. Um, and the roles that you are serving in now. And then the fact that you have mamitis, I mean, those <laughs> that, that hang out with me know that I have mamitis and papitis. In English, it's mamitis and papitis. So I love that you have mamitis and papitis. And, and I'm glad that your mom 
um, knows that even though she perhaps didn't get that phone call, that you are out there creating educational access for many students. So thank you. Is that the reason why you wanted to speak specifically about that intersection of language and culture today? Was that what attracted you to um, this particular topic? Um, yeah, I mean, it's just been my entire life. Um, but also, um, I don't know, I, I, I feel especially in the last year, um, there, there's been a lot of, um, I've been in, in a lot of conversations about, about identity and, and uh, being in rooms, a lot of times folks start off by saying things like, I don't identify as Latino, what about you? And then I say, well, yeah, let me tell you why I do, or, or um, you know, being in spaces where folks say things like, you know, I, I, I don't know about Latinx. Um, and, and I don't know why, but I, I just feel like I've been in those spaces more in the last year um, than at other times. And so it's something that's just kind of at the top of my mind, um, siempre. Me too. I mean, that's why when we um, chatted about possibilities, that meant um, that meant an opportunity for us to really connect um, in, on something that we really both uh, advocate for. It's one of the questions that I get on social media the most. I mean, I don't know if you know, but you know, I, I'm causing this madre on social media as you are. And so here's the big question, because I know that there is so much confusion around this. And I know that you've done some work, um, some deep work in terms of the difference between Latino, Latina, Latine, Latinx, um, what is appropriate and why these different terms? Because we definitely need the educators in the space to understand these as they serve emergent bilingual, multilingual students, um, culturally and linguistically diverse student communities as well. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I'd like to start by first saying that um, Latin, Latino, Latina, Latine, and Latinx the one thing they have in common is that they all refer to humans who are uh, descendants of the, the Latin American diaspora. Right? Uh, uh, now, the differences <laughs> between those five uh, uh, terms, Latin is in English, right? Uh, Latino is in Spanish, Latina is in Spanish, and Spanish is super gendered uh, when referring to, to uh, uh, people, places, and things. Uh, and, and so Latino is masculine and refers to uh, uh, somebody who identifies as a, as a man of Latin American descent. Latina is feminine and refers to a, a woman um, who identifies uh, with being of Latin American descent. And then Latina um, it is uh, all inclusive. That it, It's not gender specific. It doesn't mean man or woman or non-binary. It means all of those things. And El Dr. Medina is uh, um, way more fluent in, in switching it. If you all haven't noticed, he says, Things like todes and nosotres, with that, it seems uh, um, like very I'm fluid. Working on it, I'm working on it because for, for me, for me, <laughs> like I'll pause and you know, and I catch myself. I'll say uh, bienvenidos, and then I'll say I mean bienvenides. Uh, el doctor Medina, he's he's really super good at it. Um, uh, but but it's a it's a way of expressing um, non-binary or, or more inclusive. Uh, um, um, people, places, and things in Spanish. Uh, I always say Latinx. Um, a lot of people say Latinx, and and for me, the reason I say Latinx um, is is actually because it predates uh, Latinx for me. Um, I think maybe in 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 the next thirty or forty minutes, I'll share with you all another story. Actually, let's do a quick story time. So uh, um, <laughs> I was born in Denver. Uh, uh, eh, mi mamá y mi papá son de Zacatecas, Mexico. And when I was growing up, like my entire life, all the way through high school, I spent a pretty significant amount of time in Mexico. Um, and I made a lot of great friends there, both from kids who were like me, um, whose parents were from Miguel Ausa and had moved to different parts of the United States and would go and spend the summer there. Um, and also kids who 
were born and raised and, and still maybe live in Miguel Lapsa today. Um, and, and I'm talking about like over 20 years ago, going to La Plaza or La Alameda and hearing my friends from the small town in Zacatecas, Mexico, saying things like amiguequis. Um, in Miguel Lapsa, Zacatecas, they don't identify as Latin anything. They identify as Miguel Lapsenses or Zacatecanos or Zacatecanas or Zacate Zacatecanequis. Um, same with uh, Mexican. Um, but they would say things like amiguequis. And um, I remember asking them about that and learning about that from them. And they used it specifically in the, and, and the, I mean, back then, you would go to La Plaza and there was a group of, of young men in, in a group and, you know, 10 feet away was a group of young women in a group, generally pretty gender specific. But in those days, there was a, a young man who um, se asociaba con uh, the, the mostly uh, predominant uh, women group and they called themselves amigueki. So they didn't call themselves amigos just because that one gentleman was a part of the group, but they also didn't call themselves amigas uh, because there was only one of him. Uh, they called themselves amiguequis. And so um, sometimes like uh, usually if I, if I throw in the X, I'll say it in Spanish because that's kind of how I, I, I learned about the, the equis. But um, sorry, long story short, those five terms uh, um, all refer to to humans uh, from the the you know that are descendants of the Latin American uh, diaspora, but just kind of a few different ways of expressing it. Of course, uh, I think Latin, Latine, and Latinequis are are the most inclusive. I had never um, heard someone talk about an experience where. Um, it actually was happening in Mexico. And I think this story that you just shared, like just kind of blew my mind, right? Because one of the things that is often a pushback in terms of using Latinx or Latinequis, which I like the Latinequis, by the way, because, you know, Spanish is always the language in dual language programs that's going to get screwed over. So we always talk about amplifying right. Spanish above English. So I like the Latinequis. I, I'm, I'm going to start um, practicing that. Um, one of the pushbacks is that it was created by Chicanos in academia here in the United States. And so what would you say to those folks when you just shared this experience that's like, uh-uh, no manchin? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, um, if you follow me on social media, one of the things you'll see too is uh, whether... And I haven't posted anything in the pandemic on my Instagram because I, I haven't taken really any photographs. But if you follow me on, on, on Instagram or, or Twitter, um, and, and I'll talk about this, I think, uh, uh, at some point as well, when thinking about language and identity and culture, um, hip hop is a really big part of my culture. And, and like I'm often posting, you know, me playing a record or uh, quoting lyrics uh, that, that speak to me in, in that moment. And um, I recently had this conversation with a, um, with a friend of mine and a colleague of mine um, about um, identity because um, I'll just say here in Denver, we uh, recently uh, got a new superintendent who is from New York and uh, um, his background is, is Cuban and Dominican. And we were in a group uh, with uh, um, other Latinx uh, um, leaders in the city. And one of them in the meeting with him said, uh, I just want you to know that um, Latino um, in Colorado means Chicano or Mexican. And, um, you know, a day or two later, I met with the friend and, and we were talking about that. And what I said to him was, you know, in the in the 80s and in the 90s, today it's different, I think, because of access and social media technology. But in the 80s and 90s, for hip hop, there was really distinct regional sounds. So New York hip hop sounded a very specific way. Hip hop from Texas and Atlanta and Miami sounded very specific. Hip hop from LA sounded very different. And even not just California, but the Bay, Northern California sounded different than Southern California. The Midwest, of course, sounded different. That, that was um, 
in the 80s and 90s, I think most apparent, and, and I, I feel like it's been fading away a little bit more, where you have folks, St. John, who is from New York, who put out an album recently, I hear it, and I think he sounds like somebody from the South. Um, and, and what I shared with my friend is, at the end of the day, it's all hip hop, right? That, that um, whether it's from the South or the East Coast or the West Coast, that it's all hip hop. and. That's how I feel um, about uh, uh, the Latin American diaspora, that uh, um, we're all Latines, we're all Latinx. Um, some of us are Latino, some of us are Latina, some of us all together um, are, are Latin and Latinx. And so, um, I don't know, I, I think si se ofenden um, because of how, we choose to be more inclusive, ni modo. I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, people <laughs> should have the freedom to self-identify without judgment. Right. Um, I, I use Latinx and Latine. Um, I've been trying to use Latine more because it's an area of growth for me. Um, the reason that I'm using Latine and, and the E at the end is because it allows me to utilize it as I say bienvenides or mis amigues or todes. Um, it just allows itself um, a little bit more to to use it in that way. But at the end of the day, it's my identity. And you can't tell me that it's wrong. Um, even this week, I was facilitating PD earlier this week. And somebody said, pero la RAE, uh, la RAE dijo que no, no en, dos, en el 2018. Um, for those of you that, that aren't familiar, that's the, La Real Academia de España that kind of polices Spanish language, if we're being honest. and who cares? Because language is alive and fluid. And if people need, um, want to be identified so that they're included, then at the end of the day, that's what's important. Um, that takes me to another question that I wanted to ask you about, because I've had people that say, Jose, you should not refer to yourself as a pocho, as a mm -hmm. pocha, poche, um, wet back. And so how do you feel about reclaiming some of these terms that for a long time were used to um, really attempt to destroy us, um, but taking them as our own. And we know that there are um, young kids that are reclaiming these terms as well in schools. Yeah, I, I, I think, again, um, folks should uh, um, um, use language that makes sense for them, uh, um, that feels good to them, that represents them, and, and should reclaim... Uh, um, um, you know, whatever terms that, that they'd like to. Um, I think it's one of those things too. I've had this conversation about um, Latinx, Latinx with a lot of people. And, and there's some people who say like, no, I'm Latino or I'm Mexicano. Don't call me Latinx. And and I, I, I say, okay, <laughs> you know what? I'm not going to choose how you identify, um, but if you're in a group of people, uh, I'm probably gonna be use the inclusive term to be inclusive for everyone. Uh, but but you know, in the singular, if, if you want to be Mexicano, then I'll, I'm gonna respect that. Um, I, so I feel that way about terms in general, uh, pocho or wetback. Um, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I feel like again. I didn't know that I identified um, con los pochos until I was in Mexico, right? Where where I um, I also learned uh, uh, my 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 Spanish needed some work um, while I was there, and and I remember um, being there and me saying things like chores instead of you know pantalones cortos and my friend who's still my friend diego um correcting me laughing and saying cual es chores es un chore and and so like it, it, you know in the moment it's a it's a little embarrassing uh, a little humbling and uh and then it makes sense right like i was using this word that is super anglicized and also um i was using it in the plural um and it was just one pair of shorts and I didn't know I was pocho until I was in Mexico. I think similarly, um, you know, I, I I was only referred to as uh, uh, things like wetback 
um, when I was here, when I was in the United States. And, and I think that one was a little bit different where, um, you know, Diego laughing and calling me Bocho, sort of as a term of endearment coming from him, still a little oppressive, um, but, but more as like, llevándose uh, in a playful way. And I learned from that. Like, I, here I am 35 years later, and I don't say chotas anymore when referring to one pair of shorts. But um, I still do, just so, just so you know. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I remember saying Good. <laughs> But on the other hand, like being called wetback, for example, or going into a bathroom and, and, and seeing it in the mirror or seeing it on the walls or on stalls or seeing things that said things like go back to Mexico, um, that also oppressive, um, also, I think, a little more uh, uh, um, racist and not coming from a place of llevándose or jugando or, or, or you know, uh, endearment. Um, and... and And, and so when I think of like wetback for me, uh, that was always more hurtful than something like Pocho. Um, here in Denver, there's a, there's a graffiti artist, uh, also a good friend who has totally reclaimed that in the, in the space and bombs walls all over the city that says Los Pochos. Um, and, and I'm here for it. Yeah, you know, the reason, I didn't even know what it meant. Um, when I started doing research, it means discolored fruit in Spanish. And so that it, it literally means like we're discolored humans. Um, mine was a little bit more painful. Mis primos, my cousins in Juarez, when I would go to Juarez, when they would say pocho, they'd punch me or push me or, you know what I mean? And so for me, the pocho was physical pain. And uh, many of the times, and so I now have reclaimed it, and I and I say I'm a bocho sub, and and I know that it rubs some people the wrong way, but the reason that I've done it is for those things that you mentioned that they're a part of of what guides my work. Um, one last thing that I wanted to ask you about because the intersection of queer folks and that terminology is often just glossed over as an openly gay man. And I know that we have queer educators in the space, queer youth that each of us serves daily when we are facilitating instruction. Um, what would you say to the folks that, that are saying La Raya, La Raya says no um, in terms of the queer youth that we serve? And then that would take us right into that next question that you and I talked about before, which is um, why is this so important in educational settings in terms of that intersection of language and identity yeah thank you so much for for bringing us back to that um um i i this year um with a, a friend and and colleague um ophelia shepherds from the the metropolitan state university of denver um we we we've, we've had this conversation at the um Colorado Association for Bilingual Education recently, um, the Colorado uh, um, Association of uh, Latino Administrators and Superintendents. I pause just because they're still called the Latino part. Yeah. Um, and then uh, with the with a local school district of Latinx affinity uh, um, uh, school leaders, and the the that conversation actually is really grounded in. Um, good co-conspiratorship and allyship um, specifically for uh, LGBTQIA plus folks in the Latinx community um, who often are, are misgendered um, and not included when, uh, you know, we say things like bienvenidos and, and there's maybe a non-binary uh, uh, member of our community who, who doesn't actually feel bienvenida, right, when you say that. Um, they don't feel seen and, and they're not seen um, um, if we don't make the concerted effort to use inclusive terminology. And so those conversations that we've had this year have actually really been specific to uh, um, uh, hypermasculinity and, and homophobia and transphobia and patriarchy in Uh, Spanish and in uh, the Latinx community, um, and, and it's an invitation for uh, 
a couple of things. One is uh, to be a good co-conspirator, to be a good ally, to you know, be an inclusive uh, uh, sibling to other other members of our community, um, and then also to encourage folks to um, explore. Uh, um, identities and claim identities and learn about um, identities in school. And, um, I, I share often for me, um, none of those things really came in school. Um, that that those things I, I learned outside of school or after I, I graduated from high school. And um, I, I think that was a disservice to me. And, I, and again, uh, I, I'm here to disrupt that and, and create opportunities for kids like me to, to learn um, about themselves and others in really meaningful ways in school. Um, so yeah, I, I um, thank you for, for bringing us back to that. Um, you know, in that session, uh, um, I, I talk about um, when I graduated from high school, shortly after, maybe six months later, um, maybe a year later, I don't remember exactly, but I worked for Avid at a high school. And so I, I, I was tutoring kids who I was, you know, one year older than uh, um, or less um, right out of high school. And um, I tutored this brilliant student who, who uh, for his public speaking class, and his speech was about the expression, that's gay. Um, that was really hurtful to him specifically because he identified as gay, and people would say things like, oh, those shoes are gay, or, you know, to describe ugly shoes. And I remember, you know, being this young person, tutoring him, learning a ton, learning more from him than he ever learned from me. Um, and, and like that moment really changed my life because um, I, I realized I, I had heard people say that's gay a million times before and never said anything. Um, I hadn't been a, a good co-conspirator, a good ally. And um, I think even when you think, for example, uh, of um, uh, racial justice or racial uh, racial equity, that that you know, it shouldn't always be the job of Black, Indigenous, people of color to to fight against racism. Um, similarly, it, it's not the job of uh, of of uh, gay, lesbian, trans folks to to be fighting for LGBTQIA plus rights and representation and equity and social justice and so um i'm i'm very proud to uh call myself a, a an ally and co-conspirator and i i try to work uh really explicitly uh um at doing that better um for for our lgbtq community yeah. so I, I i'm glad you brought that back well no i'm I, it's one of the reasons why i was excited to have this conversation as well because so much of the pushback around um latina and latinx is because there's an internalized homophobia transphobia that a lot of educators have that they're not aware of and so if if, if somebody from the queer community like myself brings it up then i have a gay agenda but right. you have heteronormative privilege are well respected but through your co-conspiratorship are able to say some of these things that sometimes someone from the community is not able to. And so I'm glad that people here are hearing that sometimes when we have issues with how people self-identify, it's because we have internalized phobias that perhaps we haven't really um, tackled head on. And so thank you for that, because necesito a la gente también que no es este parte de la comunidad queer, ¿verdad? Así es que thank you for, for being a co-conspirator. So that takes us obviously to this cultural and linguistic oppression that happens in the classroom, doctor. The truth is that schools in the United States were conceptualized to promote a white monolingual, monocultural, heteronormative, patriarchal, often xenophobic perspective of teaching and learning. So what do we do? Those of us that are here in this space, what do we do in our pre-K-12, but also in our collegiate classrooms? I know we have some folks that serve in um, higher education here as well. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, it, it's interesting too, because again, I, I just mentioned, I, I learned about, uh, 
like I didn't get the opportunity to learn how to read in Spanish in school, right? That, that um, I grew up simultaneously bilingual. Uh, when I went to kindergarten, they they tested me and and did not label or identify me as an English language learner. Um, and at the time, I, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and then later, I learned that all of my other friends who who uh, were brown, who were uh, um, Mexicano, would leave our class sometimes to to go to ESL. Um, and, and I always felt jealous of that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I missed them when they left. And uh, I, I I didn't grow up um, in a dual language program and, and or didn't have ESL services, etc. And so I, I learned to read and write in English. And um, I later, you know, I was in I remember being in church, um, travieso, looking through the hymn books, so that I don't have to pay attention to what's happening. And and I could read the words um, that were in Spanish. And it was it was a pretty neat experience for me. Um, but then I never took a Spanish class in middle school or high school. Uh, eventually, I, I double majored in Spanish. But, you know, I, I was a young adult in college um, learning how to write and learning how to read uh, um, um, in Spanish. and. Uh, um, I think I'm a big also proponent of, of dual language education, and I think programs like dual language um, are super important for every student, but especially uh, I, I think students like me who, who um, you know, otherwise do not have the opportunity to really develop their full linguistic repertoires and become bilingual and biliterate. Um, and, and, and so I think that's, that's one way, right? Um, another thing, um, and we get this question often in the in the session, um, especially uh, um, you know, and it's and it's so strange. I saw you posted, I think, a TikTok the other day, or sometime you posted a TikTok about uh, um, um, your reaction to somebody else talking about. Um, you know, oh, it's fine if 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 you know people are gay, but I, I just don't want to see the you know see them in books or something like that. Um, but it, but it's true that nobody like bats an eye or asks a question about you know uh, uh, hetero relationships and books or you know uh, um, things like that, right? Where where um, in some schools in some spaces. Um, um, I think it's typical for for folks to ask, you know, do you have a family? Are you married? But they, they mean, are you, you know, if you're a woman, do you have a husband? Um, and and I think also for, for folks in the LGBT uh, uh, QIA plus community, unfortunately, they experience discrimination and, and I've heard stories where where they're discouraged from uh, uh, sharing that uh, um, you know a man has a husband or or, or, or a woman has a, a wife and um, I think we I think we need to disrupt those things um, in school specifically. You've got uh, um, Denver I think is is pretty progressive in that uh, there, there's a non non-binary and, and all gender classrooms in every school, but that's not the case in, in all schools. Um, you know, um, most systems, even in Denver, uh, like Infinite Campus that uh, track students, uh, um, you know, registration information and whatnot, have only the option of, of male and female. Um, and, you know, th those are things that um, systems um, need to change. Uh, we also get the question a lot, um, especially from, uh, uh, um, I feel, especially from like kindergarten and preschool teachers about, you know, what, what, you know are there any books out there that, uh, uh, um, you know, are, are age appropriate for three and four and five year olds? And the answer of course is yes. And um, I, I have a, a 15 month old son and, um, you know, we, we read a ton of books with him um, that, f for example, uh, a feminist baby um, that, that uh, we read with him. And, and of course other books too, like uh, anti-racist baby, right? There's a ton of books and, and, um, you know, with my son, we'll see the the 
uh, uh, we're getting our mail and we're looking at the window and he's at an age right now where he's pointing at everything and, you know, somebody walks by and he's pointing and trying to make noise and we'll look out the window and say, oh, it's the male person. Um, and that that's intentional that, you know, we'll, we'll say to my son things like, we don't know that person's pronouns. Uh, so, we're, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to say male person. And, and so, I mean, there's so many micro things and macro things that school systems and, and leaders and teachers um, could and should be doing uh, um, every day to create more inclusive spaces for for all students. Yeah, I love I love that that you've been able to kind of create this um, space for us here where we start with that Latina Latinx conversation, but in fact, it's grounded in so much intersectionality um, that I don't think we talk enough about. Um, I will say that I've been very excited about the renewed interest in anti-bias, anti-racism education. Um, but the one caveat that I keep pointing out to folks is that that's amazing work, but we also need to remember that um, the cultural and linguistic oppression that students have uh, encountered in U.S. schools has to be a part of that work. And that includes um, the LGBTQ2S plus community. And it also includes linguistic oppression because those pieces are often left out of the conversations that are happening in schools. Um, that takes us obviously, you know that I'm all about um, leveraging your entire linguistic repertoire. So the next question that I wanted to go to is, um, what is your favorite Spanglish word? Because of course, Spanglish is fabulosity embodied. And um, I know that we have a lot of chismosis, chismosas, chismosos, chismosis in the space. Claro, mira, mira, I, I need to learn how to practice that. I need to practice that. Um, so what is your favorite Spanglish word y por qué? Ah, okay. Um, creo que... It, it, it's hard for me to pick just one. Um, so I'm going to give you like three really quick examples. Perfect. I think they're the ones that I use the most, okay. right? So they're words like uh, uh, chor or, or words like uh, troca or parquear um, and, and words like uh, face. <laughs> to talk about Facebook uh, ah. with mom, with my mom, right? So, like, you know, she'll tell me, este, vi que pusiste en el face, o de qué vas a platicar, vi en el face, o tal persona puso esto en el face. Um, so, yeah, those are, those. <laughs> I love it, doctor. So, wait a minute. You have a doctor degree. You're one of, you're an educational leader at the University of Colorado Boulder Bueno Center, and you speak Spanglish? Mostly Spanglish, poquito español y poquito inglés. I mean, that's called this madre right there. That's called this madre. Just as an FYI, my favorite Spanglish word is capingón um, because I didn't know exactly what it was. For those of you in this space that don't know that, um, it's cap and gown, but I never knew that. So when I graduated from high school, my mom was mi mamá. Ay, ya, llegó, ya, ya va a llegar el capingón. And it wasn't until <laughs> I was an adult that I realized that capingón, accent over the O, in Spanish is not actually, it is a word because all language is beautiful, but it is not an official word. It's cap and gown um, a, la, a, la, a, a la Spanglish. So I love that. Okay, so we have, as you know, a lot of educators here. Um, if there was one book, whether for personal reasons, for professional reasons or resource that you feel would help folks um, in terms of their own culture and identity work or mm. in terms of service to um, the diverse student communities that they serve, what would that book recommendation be? I, I am going to share a, a, a book that I read in high school. Uh, um, and again, I was in high school. I didn't read it as part of my high school. Um, but because uh, as I mentioned, I, I didn't have the opportunity to really learn about being Mexicano uh, um, or, or being Chicano or learning in Spanish, seeing people like myself in books. In fact, uh, um, before I give you the book recommendation, I, one of the things that, uh, um, again, I mentioned hip hop earlier, but as, as somebody who, I, like I didn't, I didn't have the same connection to, to the, the rancheras and the romanticas and el rock that my parents 
uh, uh, were connected to um, in, in Spanish music. And so, I, you know, I grew up listening to hip hop. Uh, um, and, and when I went to school, I didn't see uh, uh, books about people who look like me, not even the, the famous ones, the Cesar Chavez's or the Dolores Huertas of the world. Um, and so, you know, some of my heroes became the Jackie Robinsons, uh, uh, um, the, the uh, um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., of course, and, and you know, Malcolm X and uh, um, folks who, who didn't look exactly like me, but looked more like me than than the rest of the, the books I was exposed to. Um, but long story short, uh, the book I would recommend uh, that was helpful to me is a historical fiction book uh, by Gary Jennings. Um, it's a series actually, um, one's called Aztec, Aztec Blood, Aztec Autumn. Um, and I, I learned uh, um, about a lot of uh, um, racial uh, categories that were created in Mexico specifically uh, by, by uh, Los Españoles when, when they came over and um, um, that's where I learned about them. And so uh, for me, it was, it was one way of, of uh, learning a little bit more about um, some of my, my, my histories. Yeah, have you ever read a Luis Valdez's work by any chance? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, like you, I never had any op, any access to any um, any literature as as a student. But when I got to like UTIP, aka <laughs> the University of Texas at El Paso, um, I was on, on the speech and debate team. Um, and um, my junior year, I came across this play called Los Vendidos mm -hmm. by Luis Valdez. If um, some folks haven't read it, I recommend it as well because it talks about all these different stereotypes of folks like you and I. And so I got to play like six, seven characters all by myself and travel all over the country competing. And I remember that my speech and debate coach was like, Jose, but a lot of it has Spanish words and Spanglish. What are you gonna do in Iowa with the judges from Iowa? And I said, just let me do it, I can do it. And, and so I, that's how I was able to learn for the first time a little bit about my own history as a junior at, in La UTEP, in La UTEP. So. Thank you for sharing that. And I hope that if others have questions here, um, I have one last question, but I wanted to share some of the comments here. So I love what Marta Silva put. She put, si se ofenden for how inclusive we want to be, pues mi modo. I mean, that's, you like should put that like on a Canva um, icon or something. That is a really good quotation. We definitely talked about Latinx and Latine. We talked about pocho, troca, los shorts. Um, somebody mentioned racial linguistic research. I'm assuming that they're talking about our colleagues, Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa. So definitely taking a look at racial linguistics work. Did you want to mention something? I, I thought I might have had uh, uh, Dr. Rosa's book here. Uh, I don't. Um, I, I think it might be in another room, but um, it's fantastic. And, and uh, it's interesting, too, because... Um, like I, I read the book and then I also saw one of his talks and uh, he talks about uh, a student who he had interviewed and uh, the student was sharing this experience of, I, I guess he asked him like, do you, do you, do you have an accent? Uh, I think was the question and the student said no. And then the student said, wait a minute, maybe. Uh, because I, I I was like on Xbox Live and there's kids that were like telling me, you know, shut up Mexican or like, you know, something along those lines. And the the, the student said, and I just thought, how do they know I'm Mexican? <laughs> and so um, it, it is uh, um, really, I think, really important, amazing work uh, that they've done. And, and yeah, highly recommend. Absolutely. Um, Javier was talking about um, writing here that even in um, LGBTQ plus spaces, sometimes there's discrimination because of legal status. Absolutely. Thank you for, for including that information. Um, the move from English language learner to emergent bilingual students is one of the things that, um, that has been popping up here as well. Um, there's some recommendations as well. There was a, another article that I saw Oh, Los Bukis. Somebody was just talking about Los Bukis. Yeah, I mean, didn't your, family, didn't your family yeah. force you to watch Siempre en Domingo? 
Of course. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I was going to say. The, the other day, the other day, uh, y Sábado Gigante también. Uh, the other day I was joke. I was speaking and, and the guy had a, 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 you know, the card to say uh, um, you have three minutes left and then the one minute left. And then I made a joke about uh, El Chacal is going to pull me off of the stage here if I, if I don't, you know, if I don't wrap it up. But it, nobody got it. <laughs> I would have gotten it. I would have gotten. That's where I had my first crush, Doctor. Forever, <laughs> forever, my heart will belong to Juan Gabriel from from the siempre oh, yeah. domingo moments, siempre en domingo moments. So I have my last question for you. Um, I'm a strong believer that how we grow up and the experiences that we have definitely impact. I know that that happens for everyone, but for us as educators, I think that there's something there. Um, And so my last question to you is, what is your favorite memory um, as a child and how does it impact your work now, that memory or that experience? Yeah, yeah it, that, was a, that was a tricky one. Um, and, and I think one of the things where I landed were the road trips to Miguel Ausa. So I think it's like a thousand miles away, literally, if you go straight, which we would, uh, because it, not gonna sleep in the car and you're like not gonna pay for a hotel on the way and you're not gonna miss a day <laughs> of vacation with your family and so you know we would drive straight 24 hours from from denver to miguel Ausa. um and and those were some of my favorite moments when i was a teenager um i made that trip a lot with my grandfather who who passed away uh last year and that's just one of my favorite memories of him specifically but I got to learn so much about his life um, on those trips. And uh, I joke about, you know, if, if he was driving, we'd be listening to rancheras. If, if I was driving, we'd be listening to hip hop and he preferred that I drive. Um, so so that's what we would do. Um, you know, we would stop uh, um, at Golden Corral and he loved the buffet. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a lot of really uh, neat memories specifically with him. Um, but then, of course, the experience, um, I felt like I, I, I grew up here in, in Colorado, but I also grew up in, in Mexico and, um, and, and just having that experience there and here um, are, are some of my favorite memories as a child. Um, and again, as an educator, I, I, I was able to leverage those experiences because I, I could connect to the culture of my students and their families in ways that I don't think I would have been able to otherwise. Um, one of the things that I, I uh, recently have reflected about, um, I, I, I don't pretend like my Spanish sounds like it's the only language I've been speaking since I was, I was born. Uh, but um, when uh, my students' families assumed that I, I was born and raised in Mexico, I would not correct them because I felt very proud that it was good enough to trick them um, into, into thinking it was, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was authentic from, from Mexico. So um, yeah, those are some of, some, some of my favorite memories that I, as an educator, um, lean in on a lot. Me encanta, me encanta. Uh, you need to go back and save the chat box because there's lonche in there. Like people, um, I, I, <laughs> I love the comments. Doctor, um, thank you so much for making the time to, to come to the cheese today and to engage in some desmadre. Um, I want you to know that I wanted to start this series with someone that inspires me and that I look for and look to um, guidance and, and to kind of, Learn so, así es que gracias, gracias de todo corazón. When I get on the phone, um, actually, it's going to be on FaceTime. Um, con mi mami, con mi papi esta tarde, les voy a contar del chisme. So just know that I'm super, super excited that you made the time to um, be and share the space here with all of us. Um, where can people find you in terms of social media? Because que, que vayan rápidamente a, a, a seguirlo en, en Twitter, en Instagram. Where do, where do they go to? Yeah, let me type it into the the chat here. Um, the Twitter, I think, is the easiest way to find me. And then I have a little link tree on there. So it's uh, uh, doctor underscore J underscore Rodriguez. Mira, mira, pues doctor squared aquí. Doctor squared <laughs> for this cheese session de desmadre. 
Um, you know where to find me on social media. I know videos. If you see El Doctor or myself, please make sure that you say hello. Don't act like you don't know us. Eh? That's Amigos. right. Gracias, Doctor. Adios, everybody. Un abrazo a todas, todos, todes. Adios, adios.